Many times being a minister of Jesus Christ is a very lonely job. Sometimes it's a very difficult job because you see there is a balance that has to come into play. Number one, I have to come before you. I have to edify you and lift you up so that you'll walk away from here and, and face the world the next week. And yet, God shows throughout the scriptures that he corrects his children too. So sometimes I have to come before you as a minister and correct the congregation. I can only preach it and then it's up to each individual to correct themselves by God's instructions from the scriptures. So what I want to do today is give sort of a corrective message, the one that I think all of us need. But in 1 Peter 5, verse 1 to 9, first I want you to realize that I know my responsibility as a minister. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. This is Peter writing. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. This is the instructions under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The ministry is to feed the flock of God, taking the oversight, not by constraint, but willingly. And I'll say publicly to everyone that I've never taken one cent of contributions to our work for my own use. I work for a living, and I never take a dime. So what I'm doing is strictly willingly, because I know the calling that God has given to me. And it says, not for filthy lucre or money, but of a ready mind. Be very willing to accept this responsibility. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. So I don't want a lord over you, but here's what I want to be to you. An example to the flock. I want to show you the proper way of living by my own conduct before you. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd, chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. This is younger in the faith. Submit to the elders. Yes, all of you be subject one to another. So we all have a subjection one to another. Even me to you. And I believe that. And be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. This is why we should always try to humble ourselves so that God will never resist us. And when we don't, then God is going to have to correct us. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, uh, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. So Satan wants you, and he can influence you, even as a Christian. Demons can influence. And if you're not aware of that, and always asking God, in the name of Jesus, to see to it they do not influence you, they can. And sometimes you'll not even realize it. Verse 9. He's talking about the devil, whom resists steadfast in the faith. That's what we need to do. Resist the devil. Stay within the faith. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 7. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. So here God will speak unto us as children. My son, despise not you the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. So when we have to be rebuked from time to time, then we need to realize that it's not another man doing it, but it's God through his scriptures, if we point out scriptures, and if it fits us in our individual situations. Verse 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So do you ever have difficulties? If you do, maybe God is chastening you to a degree so you can see a particular false concept in your life or maybe a particular sin which is hidden to your eyes. And yet he's wanting to reveal it to you. And he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the, whom the father chastens not? So every one of us who have had children, or who will have children, knows that we correct those children. We do it because we love them, never because we want to hurt them. In Titus 1, Titus 1, verse 9. In verse 13, well, first I'll summarize just a few verses here. The Apostle Paul is talking to Titus, and he mentions that he leaves him in Crete. 
verse 4 and 5, for the very purpose of ordaining elders among the churches there. And he goes on down and gives the qualifications of an elder. In verse 9, he mentions holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. So this is one of the qualifications of an elder, to hold fast to the scriptures, not pervert it, believe exactly what God says, and don't add to nor take away from the word of God. Because in Revelation chapter 22, your name will be blotted out of the book of life if you add to or take away. And to me, this is terrifying to think that I have to stand before you or speak maybe on radio, write in a magazine, and if I were to add to or take away, I could have my name, after all the preaching I've done, blotted out of the book of life because I haven't been faithful to this book. So I'm going to be faithful the best I understand. Well, now let's look down in verse 11. It's talking about various men, especially of the Jewish converts of that day, who really weren't converted. They weren't really converted. And he says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. So they were teaching things that were not scripturally accurate and scripturally true. So these, this is what I am coming together, coming before you with now. I feel, in verse 13 it says, This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. So if any one of us, at any time, are not sound in the faith. In other words, what, if it is black and white, there is, it is clear, then it's my responsibility to come before all of us State very clearly what that shows in the scriptures and then you make the choice. Either you want to obey God or you don't. It's up to you. Okay. Now, let's go on. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. This is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it. There's not one word that is not God breathed to his prophets or to his servants. And is profitable, here's what it's profitable for. When we open the pages of this Bible, it's profitable for doctrine. You can know the doctrine of God. It's also for reproof, for correction. In other words, when we're shooting at a bullseye and we miss it, we have to correct our aim or reproof our aim so that we can come toward that bullseye. And if we're missing the mark, then we're still in error. That's what's called sin. It's an old archer's term. Sin. You miss the bullseye, so you miss the mark. See, you're sinning. Okay, verse 17. Oh, oh, well, I'll read the last phrase here. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may become perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. This is one of the reasons why God corrects us. Now, I want to get into the topic today. By just mentioning, in Romans chapter 15, God reveals to us the purpose of the giving of the Old Testament. Why it was written down. And why we should study it, why we should look at it and live by it, even the historical part of it. Not just the law of God in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But the historical aspect of it. Romans 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, in the Old Testament time, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So we're to look back there, look into the lives of these individuals and then apply it to the New Testament Christian because it was written there and most of the people back in Old Testament times did not have God's Holy Spirit. Therefore, we can see how they lived in the physical flesh without God's Spirit and then us with God's Spirit can correct what they, the mistakes they made. Then also we can look at the spiritual giants in the Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11 of the Old Testament. We can look at these men's lives and we can correct our own lives by seeing what they did that God said they had great faith. And then we can correct our own lives. In Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Now remember the Babylonian captivity was taking place at this time. The book of Daniel is a setting where Jerusalem and all Judah had been taken into Babylonian captivity. They stayed there for 70 years. And in Daniel chapter 3, a most amazing thing was happening. Here were people who were in captivity, but their talents and ability were observed by their captives, or their captors. So as a direct result, they were put and elevated into positions of authority in the Babylonian government. Now, let's pick up right 
and they saw, and you read on down in the context, they didn't have not one hair of their head singed. They didn't even have the smell of smoke on their clothing. This is how totally and completely God can protect if he chooses to. And they knew it. And as a direct result, they wouldn't allow themselves to give in to this government as a benefactor for them and a provider of all their needs. They knew God was their benefactor. Verse 29, I'm going to lead, read the very last phrase. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Now this is why suddenly Nebuchadnezzar changed his mind and he put these men back into their offices and no more was there a threat to their lives because this man saw what the living God can do. So you see, we don't have to bow down. We don't have to submit to the final world social system that's coming called the beast, to the worship of the beast or the worship of his image or even submit to the mark of the beast. We don't have to because our God, if he chooses, can completely and totally protect us. If he chooses to, and if he chooses not to, then you can glorify God that you have been accounted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Well, that's not all because you see, God has given other instructions in the Bible, other examples that we can draw upon. Daniel chapter 6. Now this came home directly to the man that this book bears the name, Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom. Now this is a little later time. Darius now was the king. He set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, were three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first. So he set three presidents over these 120. Daniel was the top president. So that's a pretty high rank in the Babylonian government. Now verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And we know, of course, that's God's spirit and a spirit of humility and a spirit of congeniality where they would work together and he would work for the good of the people. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm, everything in Babylon, only him, the king, over them. Well, there was envy, there was strife among all the people in Babylon, not the average people, but the rulership who were vying for top dog within this governmental system. So they wanted to find fault with Daniel. So we read in verse six, 5, 6, 7, and down through here in chapter 6, that these men went in with a rush order from Darius and said, sign an agreement saying that nobody can worship any other God, nobody can pray to any other God for the next 30 days, but your God. Well, he was foolish enough to let their officers, second and third presidents, and the 120 rulers who were seeking rulership over Daniel to sign this. They goaded him into it. They rushed him into it. Verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows were open, being open toward Jerusalem. So here his windows were open. He was going to bow down and worship toward Jerusalem. And he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. This is a good example for us. Here is a man full of faith. He subdued kingdoms and, th and gave thanks before his God. And he did a time, as he did a time. So even though this decree was signed, Daniel would not give up his own religious convictions. And he bowed down three times a day. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And you have to read and see how they actually plotted to meet outside of his room because they knew he was going to bend down, face Jerusalem, and worship someone else, the true God. And so they burst in, caught him in the very act, witnesses. So they drug him before the king. Well, on down in verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, your God whom you serves continually. He'll deliver you. Because you see, Darius knew that he had been had. But once they make a law in that particular kingdom, it's final. It cannot be repealed. And so for 30 days, anyone who worshipped any god before their god, they would be cast into the den of lions. Daniel was cast in, but Darius knew 
the power of the true and the living God. And he said, your God will deliver you. And so, of course, during the night, he got up early the next morning and went to the lion's den. And he called out. And he wanted to know, are you still alive? So in verse 20, he said, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve continually able to deliver you from the lions? He wanted to know. Then suddenly he hears this voice coming out of the lion's den. It's not a spirit either. It's Daniel. He's alive. And he says, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel. Think about that now. God Almighty has sent his angel. The word angel means ministering spirit. He's a messenger. He can come as a messenger to minister to you. No matter what circumstance you're in. You're in. And he says, He shut the lion's mouth that they are not, they've not hurt me. For as much as before, him, innocency was found in me. And so the lions couldn't hurt him because of the angel of God. Shut the lion's mouth. And so the king called him on up. And now he set him over the whole realm of the kingdom. Verse 26. Notice the dramatic results that took place because of one man's faith. And because one man would not submit to falsehood. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Wow, wouldn't that be a fantastic witness when the beast power rises if all of us refuse to take that mark and suddenly God so supernaturally protects us that people can see and suddenly our food bowls don't go empty. Our gas tanks don't go empty so that we can go around where we want. Wouldn't that be a powerful witness? And what about two men called the two witnesses? Where if anybody tried to kill them, God would supernaturally in turn kill the other person. Because you see the commandment says, you shall do no murder. But you see, God made the human race. Therefore, he can choose if someone should die or not. It's not murder to him. When somebody's trying to kill you, he can take their life. Self-preservation. God can do it. And he's going to handle that through the two witnesses. And so this great God that we serve has this power. And he says that every single person should tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed in his dominion unto the end. So God's rulership is over everything. And it says he delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is a fantastic example to me of the deliverance of God and how that God can literally come on the scene, intervene in your life and my life. Because you see, those things written in the Old Testament were for our learning to see how God can intervene. And it's not that God... God doesn't have to come down and tap you on the shoulder, talk to you personally, and say, I will intervene. All we have to do is look and see how He's dealt with the nations and believe Jesus Christ when He said, I'm the same to yesterday, today, and forever. And then all the power of the universe can't stop us from obeying God. Even if God did choose to allow us to be martyred, it wouldn't matter. They can only kill the flesh. And the next instant when Jesus returns, we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. So nothing can keep us from obedience to the living God. Chapter 13 of Revelation. Now let's get into the future, not the past. Because you see, all scripture is given under the inspiration of God. So we should look at every scripture in the Bible and the prophecies. Remember, it says in Revelation 19.10... That the spirit of prophecy or the spirit of Jesus, I want to read that, I don't want to misquote it. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So we can understand the prophecies if we have the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, because he's given a whole book, the book of Revelation. 22 chapters for our benefit so that we will know what God expects of us. Look in verse 1 of chapter 13 of Revelation. I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now, chapter 17 verse 15 shows clearly what this sea is. It's all humanity. Every language, nation, tribe. It's the sea of humanity. And a beast rise out of the sea. So this beast is going to come up. 
and it's got seven heads and ten horns. Now, drop down in verse 4. Well, verse 2, the power behind this system is going to be Satan, the devil. Satan is behind this whole system and he's going to be given great authority and great power. Then in verse 4, this is going to show a little of this great power. It says, who is able to make war against the beast? Now, the United Nations organization today is working out in every nation on earth that's a member of it, the control of the military hardware of every nation by that nation and turning it over gradually to a super world government, the United Nations organization. So here is total control of the military hardware of the earth by this beast power. Then drop down to verse 7. Or verse 5, it says that this beast was going to have power to continue in total control for 42 months. That's three and a half years. So there's going to be, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, a week of years, a seven-year covenant that he's going to make. And then in the middle of that week, after three and a half years, the last three and a half years is what this is referring to. And this is when the mark of the beast, when the image and the beast is going to be worshipped, when the totality of Revelation 13 is going to be instrumental and put into effect on the earth. Verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war against the saints, to overcome them. So there's going to be a religious system and they're not going to be Christianity. They're going to have to exterminate Christianity from the face of the earth. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Total world government with all the military apparatus at his disposal. And with a total abolition of Christianity. Verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the beast, so a one world religious system with the destruction of Christianity. So the military hardware, political, worship system, all, the, all three of those are going to be implemented. Now let's drop down to verse 15. There is another beast that's going to come out of the sea. He's going to be working hand in hand with this political leader who's going to be worshipped as God. He's called the false prophet in Revelation 19. He comes on the scene in verse 11. But down in verse 15, he says that they should make an image to the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So anyone who will not worship that image or the beast himself, the political world dictator and his image is going to be put to death if you're found out. So this is going to be a horrifying time for Christians. But now look at verse 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in the forehead. We know this is the mark of the beast. But notice, this mark is only mentioned three or four times in the entire Bible. Revelation 13, 14, 15, and then down in chapter 20, where those who were resurrected, who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and they lived and reigned for a thousand years, and they had overcome all of these things. But look what it says in verse 17. This is the only statement from one end of the Bible to the other, giving the usage of this mark. That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. That's the only statement from one end of the Bible to the other, giving the purpose for that mark. It has absolutely no religious connotation. None. It says in the previous verse that we'd worship the beast, worship the image, anybody that wouldn't, they'd be killed. And then on down in the next two verses, it talks about an economic system. Not just the political system, the religious system, but then also there is an economic system. And then we've already established in the previous verses, there is a religious system of worshiping the beast and him alone and his image. So this economic system is totally separate. It's a part of the whole operation. But it is separate from everything else. So what I want to get into now, this has already come on the scene the mark of the beast. It has already been talked about. It is now the first stages have been in operation since 1973. I've been writing about this since May of 1981 and talking about it on radio. The United Nations organization in May 2nd, 1974 formed the new international economic order. And they stated that they wanted every nation would work irregardless of their social system, whether you were a dictatorship, a free society, it didn't matter. They wanted all nations to become interdependent so that all nations would be reliant upon each other. 
and they could not establish this economic system unless they had all nations working in cooperation together. How can you set up a one world economic system of buying and selling through a computer network unless all nations are involved in it and they have the same standard of exchange? Because today it's chaos. The dollar from one hour to the next changes in value in relationship to the Japanese yen, to the German mark, to the French franc, to the Italian lira. So it all changes, or to the British pound. So it changes. I've quoted many times a United States Senior Scholastic Magazine article that appeared September 20th, 1973, where they outline in detail the whole program they're wanting to institute. And it said, number one, that all consumer goods would have to have this computer mark. We all have seen it on every product you buy in stores, now in pharmacies, and it's expanding to every type of business there is. It's called the Universal Product Code. Secondly, they said that all buying and selling must be done by computer. Third, special drawing rights had to become the standard of every nation. Special drawing rights, not currency, which fluctuates in value from hour to hour and day to day. But they had to have one standard of exchange between the nations and individuals. And then fourth, they said that every individual, as well as every company and corporation, must receive a personal number which they can exchange all merchandise in their own national country as well as international community. And the fifth step, and they laid it out and even had a picture on the front cover of students walking down halls with numbers emblazoned on their forehead. And it said this number must be tattooed on the wrist or forehead so that it would never be lost. Now, does this fulfill Bible prophecy? I believe it does. I cannot see how that we could sit idly by and realize that this is on the world scene right now and not realize this is going to be the mark of the beast. Now, I've got a question. Why does God absolutely, totally, irre irrevocably, irrevocably forbid any Christian to take the mark of the beast? Why? Why is it such a sin that God absolutely promises, and if you want to turn there, Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. And I'm going to read this. If any man, this is the promise of God, if any man worship the beast and his image, of course we know that's idolatry, and in addition to that, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wrath of God. And we know that no Christian with God's Holy Spirit is going to receive the wrath of God. Only if they worship the beast, his image, or if they take the mark. Why is it that the wrath of God will be poured out on anyone who does any of those things? The word mark, the Greek word mark, means is sharagma. And it literally means a scratch, etching, stamp, or sculpture. That's what it means. It could be any one of those four. And it's similar to a tattoo which you see Navy personnel and Army personnel sometimes put into their body. Well, we've been showing since May of 1981 that laser beam tattoos have already been perfected. And they can literally, the technology is right now being manufactured and set in place to administer this laser beam mark already. And then they put it on the human body and it is totally invisible unless you do one of two things. You can run it under a certain type of light and it shows the markings. Or you can run it across a scanner and these rays come up, read the lines, and then it transacts the business, just like it does with the universal product code scanners in grocery stores right now. We've been showing very clearly newspaper article, magazine articles, news telecasts, broadcasts, where they're talking about a cashless, coinless, checkless society now for three years. We've shown very clearly how they're setting up and establishing the instant transfer of funds on a global basis. And now I've got a letter written to me personally from a man in Australia. And he's even given me the name of the organization there that has been in, placed in charge of setting up the transfer of funds all over the Australian continent. And so it is also hitting Australia. So this is not just in the United States of America. They've already been using it in Europe even before right here in America. But many people have really scoffed. They really have. 
And that's unfortunate. They say that the mark in the book of Revelation cannot be forbidden to take. They say it's only an economic convenience. To be exact, one large church organization put in their magazine that goes in 24 foreign countries, wrote an entire article to rebuff the statements that I made about it. And it went all over. Telling Christians, oh, these are only electronic conveniences. It has nothing to do with the mark of the beast. That was fulfilled hundreds of years ago in the Roman Empire. Because you see, this group believes in the Seventh-day Sabbath, and they say the Sabbath is the mark of the beast. You can't buy and sell because they won't let you on Sunday. Well, you can buy and sell six other days of the week. This says no man can buy or sell unless you have this mark. Not just six days of the week, but one day you can't buy or sell. It says, period, no man can buy or sell. Well, anyone who comes to you and says you can take the mark, it's only electronic convenience, is misleading you. They really are, because we've already read Revelation 14, 9 and 10, where it states clearly, very clearly, anyone who worships the beast first, secondly, worships the image, thirdly, receives this mark and is farther in his hand, is going to receive the wrath of God. It's clear. There can be no other explanation. Now, there's been several people who've been praying very hard about this. Why would God say, don't take a mark? It's just like someone, a Navy personnel, going out and having a tattoo put on them. Only this mark would give you the opportunity to buy and sell in a society. Well, Leviticus 19, verse 28, is part of the answer that I believe was given. And here's what it said. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. And the word translated for Lord into the English language is Yahweh. means the eternal God, the ever-living one, the self-existent one. This is the creator of everything. He's, but then we can ask ourselves, why in the world would God say, no cuttings, no marks, nothing in the human flesh. Clark's commentary on this particular verse, and I'm going to quote it word for word. It was a very ancient and a very general custom to carry marks on the body in honor of the object of their worship. Ancient writers abound with accounts of marks made on the face, the arms, in honor of different gods. And to this, the inspired penman, that's John in the book of Revelation, alludes in Revelation 13, 16, and 17, Revelation 19, verse 9 and 11, Revelation 15, 2, Revelation 16, 2, Revelation 19, 20, and Revelation 20, verse 4. He alludes to these marks. And this always represented false worshipers as receiving in their hands and in their foreheads the marks of the beast, the system of the particular time that John saw. Paul says, I bear about in my body the marks, and the Greek word is stigmata, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 6 verse 17. According to Clark's commentary, any time marks were put into the body, it was for ultimately to show who was your boss, who you were going to worship. Marks in one's body are only to honor another god in ancient times. And when John wrote this, he understood all of this. And it was to show who you were a slave to and a servant of a particular god. And when you stop and think about this, it's breaking both the first and the second commandment. I want to read both of those from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Exodus 20 verses 1 to 6 from the Amplified. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Remember now, God is their benefactor. God is their provider. He's the source of everything they have. You shall have no other God before or beside me. This is the amplified version, so it gives a little more color to it. You shall not make yourself any graven image to worship it or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. And how do you hate God? By not obeying what He says. You show total disrespect to God. 
but showing mercy and steadfast love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now he said he was the one that brought them out of bondage, out of the land of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 7 verse 19 to 25, you see God beginning to intervene. He had already sent previously Moses and Aaron down into the land of Egypt. They had already confronted Pharaoh. And suddenly Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. So God used his first miraculous effort to bring these people out. And for once in all time, he was showing who was in control of this earth. He used, turned the water to blood to show his supernatural power that he could deliver his people. Remember that. Exodus 8, verses 1 to 15, he brought on a whole plague of frogs for the very express purpose of backing up his first miracle to show that he can deliver his people from all evil. Because you see, here's God on one side and here's Israel who was counted as righteousness. Then here's Egypt and Pharaoh and he was counted as evil. So it's God's side and Satan's side. God was going to show humanity once and for all and write it in the pages of the Bible who's in control. So that when you and I see these things, we'll never have to worry about Satan, his demons, their power as far as compared to the power of God. In chapter 8, verse 16 to 19 of Exodus, the plague of lice came upon the whole land. Chapter 8, verse 20 to 32, the plague of flies covered the land. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, cattle suddenly began to have all kind of diseases and they were dying in the fields. Exodus 9, verse 8 to 12, boils came upon the people so that they couldn't even sit no matter where they laid, sat. They were so discomforted, they couldn't sleep, they couldn't work, they couldn't carry on their national activities. And then chapter 9, verse 18 to 26, there was hail came from the sky. And some of it was so large it could kill cattle standing in the field and human beings who were outdoors. Exodus 10, verse 12 to 15 showed the locusts coming over the land. They literally ate every green veg piece of vegetation in the entire country. All the leaves, all plants, all crops in the field. Notice what's happening now. Satan on the one side and God on the other side, Satan's system is being systematically destroyed by the power of God. Whose side do you want to be on? Exodus 10, verse 21 to 23, there was darkness that covered the land. And then in Exodus 12, verse 29 to 30, that final death angel that brought deliverance to Israel. What God is doing is totally destroying the power of Satan. He's showing who's in charge of this earth. He took Egypt, an evil nation representing sin, and he's delivering his people who are counted as righteous. Not that they were. They were sinners just like all the rest of us. But God imputed righteousness to them. He totally destroyed their water system. It was all dead. No fish could live in it. They couldn't fish for food. A total destruction of their cattle for food. A total destruction of all the crops in the field. So that no food for the people in that land. The firstborn of every family died. It was to carry on the lineage and to receive the inheritance. So in other words, what God was doing, and then suddenly they said, leave our land. And so they went around and God gave them favor, the Israelites' favor in the, in the eyes of the Egyptians. They gave them their gold, they gave them their silver, they gave them all their jewelry. They gave them everything of value so that by the time the Israelites went across the Red Sea and even the military forces of Egypt were drowned in the sea, Egypt was a broken nation and it has never again become a great nation on the face of the earth. God totally destroyed it. Can God deliver you? I believe He can. And I believe He will. And I believe we're going to see some of that and it's going to be a wonderful experience for all of us. It was a custom in the cultures of that day, of ancient times in Old Testament, where slaves, slavery was accepted. And so slaves would accept marks or brands so that they would be identified as a certain man's slave. Just like we today brand cattle and so that we know what our cattle is and, and a difference to somebody else's. So if you receive the mark of the beast just to buy and sell, you're literally putting yourself into slavery under the beast system. That's what it amounts to. 
in effect. You are worshiping the beast because the beast becomes your benefactor. He becomes your sustainer. He becomes your provider of everything instead of God. And just like ancient Israel, God destroyed that system and brought His people out. God is going to destroy this final system and He's going to bring His people out. He's going to do it. So we cannot take the mark of the beast because the beast system then becomes a God and we're totally dependent for everything that we do. To be exact, they now have, they're working on even a telephone system where every one of us would receive a telephone number. No matter where we go, the phone will ring closest to where you're standing. They can keep track of you no matter where you go on a global basis. If you're a part of this system, you're going to be theirs. You're going to be their slave. Romans 6, verse 16. I'll read this from the Amplified. It says, Do you not know that if you continually surrender yourself to anyone to do His will, you are the slaves of Him whom you obey? You take the mark. He tells you when you can buy and sell. He tells you how much meat you can buy, whether it's three ounces a week, five ounces per person. He's going to tell you all these things. I'll go ahead with the Scripture. Whether that be to sin, which leads to death, or the obedience, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Right doing and right standing with God. So whoever we submit ourselves to, that's who we're slaves to. Whether to God or to the system. Matthew 6, verse 24. I'm reading from the Amplified once again. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other... Think about that. Or he will stand by and be devoted to the one and despise and be against the other. You want to take the mark of the beast? You can't serve two gods. You can't do it. So either you're going to take it and you'll serve the beast system and Satan or you will not take it and you'll serve God. It says you cannot serve God and mammon. And remember this is the Amplified? All right, this is thrown in extra. That is deceitful riches, money, possessions or what is trusted in. You can't serve things that you trust in over the true and the living God. 2 Peter 2, verse 18 and 19. This, once again, is from the Amplified Version. And it's talking about false ministers, false preachers that will come in the last time, and they're going to deceive people. They're going to use them for their own purposes. It says, For uttering loud boasts of folly, they beguile and lure with lustful desires of the flesh, Those who are barely escaping from them who are wrongdoers. So here we're talking about men who are coming in acting like ministers of Jesus Christ, but they're really living after the flesh. And they have enslaved people who are following them who are also living after the flesh, and they're barely trying to escape out of their midst. They, these false ministers who are walking after the flesh, promise them liberty. You're free when they themselves are the slaves of depravity and defilement. For by whatever... Now listen to this. This is dynamite. For whatever, by whatever, anyone is made inferior. If you receive the mark, aren't you made inferior to the beast that's giving it? Or overcome... So if you're overcome by the beast, you're now inferior. Or worsted. In other words, bested. If they get the best of you... To that person, he is enslaved. You want to take the mark of the beast? Then you are going to be worsted. You're going to be bested by them and you become the slave of that system. You're not God's slave. You're the slave of that system. So I believe it becomes obvious that our Creator God, the great God of the universe, takes it as a very serious sin, observance and subservience to another besides Him. We need to consider that He gave Israel over into physical slavery to all the neighboring nations around them, all because they bowed down to other gods beside him. All you have to do is go back and read the book of Judges, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Read the prophecies of Ezekiel, how the house of Israel, and this is talking about modern day, right before Christ's return, is going into national captivity for one reason. They turned to other gods and they're not keeping God's Sabbath day anymore. Read it. Ezekiel chapter 20. Six times in one chapter he says it. They're going into national captivity. They don't even know they're God's people. 
But they're going because they've refused God. But we have to look at something else. What about Esau? Esau was a man who was in direct line to receive the birthright. Jacob and Esau were born. Esau was the oldest. Jacob was the second. Esau was to receive the birthright of double portion of inheritance. And yet, we see that all the responsibilities that goes along with that, Esau gave it up all for a bowl of porridge, meat for the belly. He forfeited everything that the United States and the British Commonwealth has had since 1804. They've had at one time 95% of certain of the chemicals or gold, silver, chromium, and lead, iron, and the entire world under their possession. He forfeited that for a bowl of food. And that's all. God said Esau despised his birthright. And as a direct result, God said Esau I hated. He loved less in comparison than he did Jacob. Because Jacob was a prince with God. He wrestled with Jesus Christ all night long until, and he wouldn't let him go. Until finally God and Jesus Christ blessed Jacob. And he changed his name to Israel because he was an overcomer with God, but Esau wasn't. You see, only overcomers will go into the kingdom of God, not those who give in to the flesh. But Jacob knew that a place in God's kingdom and his service was worth more than just a bowl of food. He knew that anything earthly and physical was not, would not stand in his way. And if it did, it became a god to him and he became a slave to his own belly. And we have to remember that. And he said, Jacob I loved, but Esau he hated. And he rejected. There was a woman by the name of Pat Brooks. She wrote a book. It was called Hero Israel. And she pointed out the following. I want to quote it. Esau passed the point of no return when he chose food instead of God. So today, in the welfare state, and that's all the beast system is going to be that's rising, is a welfare state. Notice what he says. She says, In the welfare state, some look to it, the welfare state, rather than God for their security. Will they take the mark of the beast just to keep a job or to keep food stamps coming or social security or some other government benefit? They had better heed the divine warning, quote, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, but he didn't, Jacob did, but he would have, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And that was, she quoted that from Hebrews 12, 15 to 17. So do we want to take the mark of the beast? Do we want to come under a system where they are our total benefactors? Well, I want to read a few scriptures as we come down to the close here. In the following scriptures, God has given, I believe, his opinion or judgment upon anyone who puts the satisfaction of material needs before their faithful obedience to him. Philippians 3, verse 15 to 20. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Version. So let those who are spiritually mature, hopefully that's going to be all of us, Hopefully. And full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. And if in any respect you have a different attitude of mind, God will make that clear to you also. So if you don't have the same mind God does, hopefully he's going to make that clear to you or else you'll probably end up taking the mark of the beast. Only let us hold true to what we have already attained and walk and order our lives by that. So this Bible, we're becoming mature. Brethren, together... Follow my example. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. He obeyed. He said, follow me as I obey. Observe those things who live, or observe those who live after the pattern which we've set before you. For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. Notice what Paul is telling the Philippians back there. It's for our day too. All scripture is God breathed for every Christian of every generation. Here's what he said. There's even those walking then who walk or live as enemies of the cross of Christ, the anointed one. They are doomed and their fate is eternal misery. Listen to this. 
Their God is their stomach, their appetites, their sensuality. They'd rather eat than obey God. And they glory in their shame, siding with earthly things and being of their party. They're siding with earthly things and I'd rather eat than obey the plain statements of Scripture. But we, this is New Testament Christians who have the exact same mind as Jesus Christ, who are mature, but we are citizens of that state which is in heaven. See, our citizenship is in heaven. Our names are enrolled in the book of life. And from it we earnestly and patiently await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Savior. Now, we need to also read from the Amplified Version, Jude, verse 4, verse 11, and verse 16. For certain men have crept in stealthily. In other words, unawares, craftily. Their doom was predicted long ago. Why? Why were they predicted to go into doom? They are ungodly persons who pervert the grace, which is the spiritual blessing and favor of God into, notice what they're doing, they're perverting the grace of God into lawlessness, which is lasciviousness in the King James, and wantonness, lust, and immorality, which is a license to break God's Ten Commandments, and disown and deny our soul master. This is what it says in the Amplified Version. Our soul, one and only master, there is no other. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Verse 11, Woe to them, for they have run riotously, riotously in the way of Cain. Cain killed Abel. Why? Because he was walking after the flesh, Abel after the spirit. He couldn't stand it. And have abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to the error of Balaam. Balaam was a high priest. He was a paid, bought off minister. He was, he was bought off to go curse Israel by the pagans, and he did it. But then God wouldn't let him curse them. He got there and God wouldn't let the words he wanted to speak come out of his mouth. But he was a paid off minister. He wouldn't preach the truth. And yet it says these ministers of today who say, Submit yourselves to the beast government. Submit yourselves to it. And that way you'll be safe throughout it. Take the mark. They're paid off. They're not standing by the truth of God. And it says they perished in rebellion like that of Korah. Korah rose up against God's minister, Moses and Aaron, and they were swallowed up the earth. They just opened up and swallowed them all up because they were in rebellion to God Almighty. And this is what's going to happen to those who do not subject themselves to the mind of Jesus Christ and refuse the worship of the beast, the worship of the image, or take the mark. They must refuse it all. It also says... These are inveterate murderers that are murmurers that complain of their lot in life. Woe is me. They're going after their own desires controlled by their own passions. In other words, the flesh. Many religious leaders today, and I've heard them, they've said, don't fear the mark. This is a direct quote from a cassette tape that was sent to me and I heard it with my own ears. The Holy Spirit in you would never let you take the mark. If you don't know what the mark is, how are you going to avoid it? Others say, all Christians will be raptured away before the mark is administered so you don't have to worry about it in the first place. Humans can rationalize. Humans do not want to face the fact that the beast system is rising. They don't want to face... The fact that God Almighty said, don't you take it, or the wrath of God is going to come upon you. They don't like to face it. They become very uneasy. How am I going to eat? How am I going to be clothed? Because, you see, you can prove very easily in Scripture that when the mark of the beast is administered, there's going to be Christians on this earth. Otherwise, how are they going to be martyred for not taking the mark of the beast? That's just logic. Well... Jesus said very clearly in Revelation 13 and 14 that the mark was a reward for worshiping a man. It is not a mark of worshiping on a certain day as some groups have taught in the past. 
There is no buying and selling to be done, period, without that mark, unless you receive that mark. He also forbids Christians to worship the beast, to receive his mark, which is the, his name or the number of his name, and it has something to do with 666. Just like it is on the UPC codes, you can prove that every one of them are encased with the number 666. You can search Revelation 13 through 21, every place where the mark is mentioned. You can never find one place where Jesus Christ gives permission to a Christian to keep the mark, or to take the mark of the beast. You can't do it. And yet you can only find one statement, Revelation 13, verse 17, that gives the purpose of the mark. So that no man can buy or sell unless he takes the mark. That's the only one. Even if it has no religious significance, you still don't take that mark because it's a part of the system. You submit yourself to the system. You become a servant to the system. You become a slave to it. But in direct contrast, notice Revelation 20, verse 4, the first part. This is just the first part of that particular scripture. This is in direct contrast to the scriptures where there was no permission given whatsoever to take the mark. Here's what it said of anybody who refused it. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or their hands. So instead of having the wrath of God coming upon you for taking the mark, the exact opposite is the truth. You're going to live and reign with Jesus Christ for refusing it and, if necessary, being martyred for it. So does God give permission anywhere in Scripture to receive this mark? Oh, no, He doesn't. Exact opposites are portrayed. Now, let's turn to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Here is where some people have stated that we're going to be caught up in a pre-tribulation rapture. But it shows very clearly that some Christians will be alive even throughout this whole beast system. Because it says when Jesus returns and the, seven, and the trump sounds will be who are alive, will not precede those who are dead. Those who are dead are going to be caught up and we're going to be changed. And you compare that to 1 Corinthians 15, it states exactly the same thing. So when Jesus returns, there's going to be somebody alive on this earth that has not received the mark because they're going to be changed from flesh to spirit. Well, now I want to go on and read Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34. We're getting down toward the end, but I think this is very vital that we go through every bit of this. Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. So you ask, how are we going to survive if we don't take the mark of the beast? Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. This is Jesus talking to Christians. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet your own body, what you shall put on. So clothing, it doesn't matter. Don't think about it. Is not the life more than meat for the belly, just to keep us alive, and the body than raiment? Life is more than just the physical things. Verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Oh, yes, we are. Which of you, by, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? None of us. But just saying, I want to be an inch taller. We can't make ourselves grow an inch taller. And why take you thought for raiment? Clothing. Consider the li lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. They don't go out and work for a living as we do. Verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God took care of the, the flowers of the field. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not more clothe you? O you of little faith. God is going to take care of you. You don't have to worry about it. He's going to work miracles. He took Israel out. They saw no physical way for them to survive. They didn't have time to stop, plant crops in the ground. God kept them on the move all the time purposely so that they could not plant. They couldn't become established. That way, God Almighty could prove that He was their sustainer. 
He was their benefactor, not the beast and worldly governments. Verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or, or how are we going to be clothed? For after these things do the Gentiles seek, through the five senses of the body. For your heavenly Father knows that what you need, need, you have need of all of these things. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Desire to be in the kingdom and to keep His God's law perfectly in your life with His Holy Spirit. And all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, take no thought for the morrow. For the morrow will be sufficient. You don't have to worry about it. God is going to take care of you. And He's shown it very clearly. I believe that Jesus tells us first to seek His kingdom. Don't worry about anything else. Oh yes, while we have time, we need to eat, we need to work, we need to supply our needs. But when it comes time to where we have no choice except to either accept God or accept the beast and his mark, the choice is clear. God is our benefactor. But you see, he said, Oh, you of little faith. You see, we have to develop by looking at those things written aforetime, the faith to know that God's miracles will carry us through. In Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, I'm going to read from the Amplified. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And what is the will of God concerning the mark of the beast? He says, if you take it, my wrath is going to be poured out on you. I believe we can confidently say the will of God is refuse the mark, even if it means death. Even if it means that. Many will say unto me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, driven out demons in your name, and done many mighty works in your name? And I'll say to them openly, publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me. Why? You who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. And his commandment was, don't take the mark. Matthew 5, verse 17 to 20. And this is very important for us. This is the Amplified Version. Do not think that I've come to do away with or undo the law and the prophets. I've not come to do away with or undo, but to complete and fulfill them. For truly I say, until the sky and earth pass away and perish, not one smallest letter nor one little hook will pass from the law <clears throat> Excuse me, until all things have been accomplished. Now, listen to this next verse. Whoever then breaks or does with, away with or relaxes one of the least important of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least important in the kingdom of heaven. Do you want to be least important? Then teach men to do away with one of the commandments of God. Not just the Ten Commandments, but how about the commandment not to take the mark of the beast? Now, listen to this. But he who practices them and teaches others to do so shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Let's be great. Let's do. Let's strive for that. And ask for God's Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us in abundance so that we can have the power to always put God first. In Matthew 24, verse 37, it also mentions that as the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. This is our generation. You can go back and read Genesis 6 and verse, or chapter 6 and chapter 7. You'll see that Noah was the only righteous man left on the earth. Before God destroyed that whole wicked civilization, he warned Noah. He warned him. He foretold him that the whole earth was going to be destroyed. Notice what Noah did. He literally took some physical preparation. And he went out. This is in addition to preaching that the world was going to be destroyed. He preached the entire time that he was building the ark to all who would come and listen. But then he was always building the ark. Building the ark. He was literally building a floating zoo with eight people to be inside with him. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 21 and 22, I'll read that. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten. Now, I'm saying this for a reason. You shall collect and store it up. Here's a man, a dynamic man of faith, forewarned of God that something was going to happen. The whole world was going to be destroyed, all people. And yet he warned him. And what did Noah do? He took food. 
He stored up food. And it shall serve as food for you and for them, the rest of his family. Noah did it. As in the days of Noah, what did Noah do? He stored food. He did. And he went through the entire flood. Jesus says, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So is it, ru- is it wrong for us Christians to look at Put what was left over. In both cases it was chicken. Not that that means anything, but, but anyway, they would eat part of this chicken. Put it back in and the next day it was all there. This was in their dream. And there is precedence for that in the Bible. Elijah. Remember Elijah? And it's recorded. I won't turn to it, but you can read it. 1 Kings 17, verse 9, 9 through 16. Where Elijah went to the woman and said to her, Feed me. She only had a little flour, and she was going to make some bread, feed her own son, and then herself, and die because of the famine. And Elijah said, No, you make that, but feed me first. And she did. And every day the oil and the flour kept it stayed as high as it was the day before. They never ran out of food for three and a half years during the duration of this famine. God can and will work miracles. Remember Revelation seven or Revelation twelve verse fourteen. It talks about a woman that fled into the wilderness. Could it be that God wants us to start providing the best we can physically for ourselves, and then what we can't provide, God will supernaturally provide the rest. I'm just asking a question. I want us all to look at it, to study it. So anyway, I believe this is very important. Now my closing scripture for today is going to be Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 24 to 27. Matthew 16, verse 24 to 27. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is totality. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. You want to take the mark? You're going to lose your life. He's already said so by the wrath of God. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And we've already seen in Revelation 20 verse 4 to 6 that if we're willing to be martyred, if necessary, we're going to live and reign as kings and priests with Jesus for a thousand years. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what is a man if he, if he, what is he going to give in exchange for his soul? That's what Christ is asking. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall give reward, every, give his reward to every man according to his works. I believe that we need to be very, very careful anytime we're talking to anyone about the mark of the beast to make sure we understand that the mark is not to be taken under any circumstance, no matter what. Because Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10, pointedly says that anyone who takes the mark will drink of the wrath of God. This is the doctrine of Jesus Christ concerning the mark. Don't take it. Anyone who rejects this truth, we should be very careful about it. We don't want to send anyone to the lake of fire and to the wrath of God. But we must stand up for truth and be counted worthy to escape all these things by holding to all truth and never giving in, watering down, and compromising with truth.